Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first uh, Corinthians, verse by verse, and in our last study we were uh, in chapter 2, uh, somewhere around the verse, uh, uh, verse 5. And so I'm going to try to cover verses 5 through 10 in this video. I want to thank you all for all of your love, your comments, your encouragement, your support. I hope everyone out there is doing well. Uh, we may spend a little time here today on the text, so grab a cup of coffee and join us. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're just so aware of our limitations. Uh, we're so grateful for the access that we have, to, uh, the fellowship that you've given us, the opportunity that you've given us to study your word, to feast on it uh, together, to think about it, to meditate on it, to pray about it. I just thank you for the wonderful uh, blessings that we've received in Christ. I ask that you would take and seal that uh, which is true to our hearts, filtering out all of the foolishness, all of the ignorance. And I ask this in Christ's name I pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. In order that your faith should not stand in men's wisdom, but uh, in God's power, uh, not stand in man's wisdom, but in God's power. That's the same as God's wisdom, and that's Christ. I've tried to point out in previous videos that that's, that is Christ. And when we ended the first chapter, uh, we found that Jesus Christ was by God made uh, unto us wisdom, uh, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. I think it is vitally important that we think uh, uh, that Christ and what He's done for us as we softly step through these verses 5 through 10, uh, as well as uh, the fact that God is sovereign. I often get so criticized for that, but it is Christ who has made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Uh, it's He who is our substitute. Uh, it's He who left heaven's glory to be uh, become incarnate and to die in our place. I've stressed this over and over and over again, but the important thing is that virtually every church is preaching the love of God. I mean, it's the prevalent theme of Roman Catholicism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mormonism, uh, just about every denomination uh, in the modern church. But the love of a, of, a, of a God, folks, who is not sovereign, that's an interesting concept. A God who loves you but is not sovereign is a frustrated God. He, he says that he's whatever he's will. He, he will do that on, in heaven and on earth. And so if he's not sovereign, folks, his love means nothing. I am told that whatsoever God pleased, he did in heaven and earth and in all deep places. And all we have seen is the evidences of the sovereign God. It started out that you were sanctified, set apart, 
uh, and sanct that's through one offering, Hebrews, set apart forever, them that are sanctified. That, God, that says that God has set you apart uh, for Himself. He doesn't have the ability to do that. He's sovereign. We read where Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Verse 2, in order that, that your faith stands not in man's wisdom, but in God's power. I spent a little time talking about the wisdom of man. Uh, that's God's wisdom. God's wisdom is Jesus Christ. Okay, what He did for us through the cross. So when He's preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified, He's preaching the wisdom of God. He's preaching Christ. And so we don't need to guess at this stuff. Uh, the simple fact is that the wisdom of God is Christ and Him crucified. The power of God is Christ and Him crucified. Of course, we're talking about the Gospel. Yet there's a number of books written on what is that this wisdom. You know, what is this power? And we're looking at a comparison here between the wisdom of men and the wisdom of God. Dearly beloved, the wisdom of God is Jesus Christ. You don't have to puzzle over the expression. God is a genitive, uh, the genitive of possession. It's God's wisdom. And, and what is God's wisdom? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's the wisdom of God. And that's extremely important, I believe, to bear in mind as we go through these amazing verses. Uh, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now, a, a possible translation would be mature. I think maybe a better translation would be complete. We know from uh, Colossians that we, we are complete in Him. Uh, the text surely means one who is redeemed. We're preaching to those who are redeemed. We're not preaching to anybody else. This is God's love letter to us. And, and that's important. The modern concept is that God loves everybody. So we ought to preach to everybody and we ought to give them the opportunity to come to Christ. But dearly beloved, the Holy Spirit here, He says here that the preaching is to those who are now complete, perfect. And the only way that they can be complete is to be new creations in Christ Jesus. And that's going to present, that, that's going to present a, a little bit of a problem as we, when we get to chapter 3. Because we're going to see an apparent distinction between those who are spiritual and those who are carnal. You know, because there's a strong consensus among Christians today that there are spiritual Christians and there are carnal Christians. There are the, the good Christians and then there are those who are not so good. Maybe even there, there are those who are really, really bad there are those who are really, really good. And my, of course, my question is, how could Jesus Christ, God Almighty, become incarnate, leave heaven's glory and die in my place that I might be redeemed and, and do such a rather poor job of it for some of His children? I mean, honestly, folks, do you, is that what you believe? You know, where that I wound, I wound up being one of the carnal ones, and then there's, you know, and then there's, you know, Jeff and Marilyn and over there, or Glenn or David or Larry or Deborah or whoever, you know, and they're the spiritual ones. And so what we do is we divide the body of Christ into those who are good and those who are not so good, those who are really super good and those who are just really awful and you know is that what Christ did folks 
Do you honestly believe that Jesus Christ did more for Paul than he did for you? If he died in your place, what more could he have done? Uh, I, you know, I, I say those things to stress the sovereignty of God because I tell you, uh, most Christians don't believe that because they're weighed down with the knowledge of sins that they've committed in the past. Oh, how in the world can, can I be so loved by the Lord Jesus Christ given what I've done? I've heard it a thousand times if I've heard it once. You know, kind of like, you know, David who committed murder and adultery, and, and yet it, God said he was a man after his own heart. Could a Christian do that? Well, the old man could. But are we to suggest that no person who is a new creation in Christ could do that? You know, what, what sins can a child of God commit? You know, to... I would say that, that the Christian can, can commit every sin that a non-believer can commit. I don't see any difference. The old man does what it does. But we tend to rate sins as being bad and really bad. And well, there's those that's not so bad. God does not do that, folks. He doesn't do that. In fact, many Christians I know agree that no sin is any greater than another. That's what they'll say. But we tend to do that. You have an old man that does nothing but sin. It's you and it's me who, you know, who sort of grade sins. So there are some who sin a lot more than others. So he had to do a lot more. You know, and those are all foolish reasonings. Those, those are, that is the wisdom of man, not the wisdom of God. But such were some of you, but you are cleansed. You're washed. You're new creations in Christ Jesus. He didn't do. He did not do less for you than he did for someone else. And to say that you're a, a, well, you're less of a Christian than some other Christian it is, in my opinion, it's really that's that's to blaspheme the finished work of Jesus Christ. We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, complete, redeemed. The word there in the, in the original text actually means that they've reached their goal. They didn't do it by human works. They didn't do it by exercising their own faith. Faith is a gift from God. But because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ who died in their place. It is not the wisdom of the world, nor of the princes, our text says, the princes of this world who are coming to nothing. The, the grammar says they are continually coming to nothing. Okay, It's a present tense. They are constantly being made nothing. Now take note of the little crosses that I placed next to the words. I hope you'll see this on the screen here. Uh, and the phrases in, in the context, words which I believe are markers by the Holy Spirit directing our attention to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, crucified, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, uh, on our behalf. Surely, in the near context that the, the princes are the leaders of the Jewish nation, I believe that it is correct to, to look at it that way, who in some sense at least were responsible for the crucifixion of our Lord. Of course, we know it was ordained by God. I got into an interesting discussion on that with a brother last night. But they were the leaders of the nation. They were the leaders of the nation at that time. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying much more than that. I believe that that he's saying that those who are considered rulers and leaders in this in the world religious system, keep in mind this is an ecclesiastical context. 
Okay, you can you can call the princes Putin and Trump and Biden and stuff like that if you want, but I think we need to stick with the context. In the age in which they are living, we are now living. They are coming to nothing. First and foremost, we are looking at an ecclesiastical context. We're looking at a church context, the church at Corinth. Uh, the word princes, rulers, okay? You know, it has to apply in an overall sense, but God says, says that he sets up over the nations whosoever he wills, so I'm absolutely persuaded that God put them there. may not like it, but I'm, I have to, to, to believe that God put them there. And that's whether in the church or outside it, but we're, but we're looking at inside the church here. We're looking at uh, preaching uh, wisdom. And I, and I tell you that that wisdom is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I determined to know nothing save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I've had, uh, I've had ministers say, you know, I agree exactly with you, Steve, on the sovereignty of God, but if I preach that to my congregation, they'd all walk out. I'd lose, or I'd lose half my congregation. Well, God doesn't seem to pull any punches here. God tells you, you know, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Uh, I, I believe in, in uh, the first chapter we saw three times God say He chose us. It couldn't be any more clear on that. So we can't get away from the fact that God's wisdom is centered in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Christ in Him crucified. Which, uh, no doubt, you know, would no doubt include everything that God provided for His people through the, the cross. He didn't, he didn't die to make it possible that, that men would be saved if they come around to want to be, okay? And it seems to me that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the certain seal, the absolute seal, the stamp of approval, uh, on the fact that he died in my place and uh, and his death was sufficient. Nothing to be added to that. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ includes his death, his burial, his resurrection. Every Christian knows that. Uh, I'm told in, uh, in Acts uh, chapter 15 here that uh, what Paul preached at Corinth was the Word of God. Uh, so look what we have. We are told that the Word of God is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Uh, it's Him crucified. The wisdom of God is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And that means that our preaching then ought to be centered in what the sovereign God did for us when He was crucified. Uh, what the sovereign God did for us. I don't believe any single one of you who are uh, God's ch children, uh, are, you're not anywhere except where He ordained you to be. You know, you're as ugly as He designed you to be or as handsome as He designed you to be. You're as rich or as poor as He designed you to be. Uh, that's what I believe. Uh, I believe you're exactly where God wants you to be at this moment in your life. If you're not, then He's not working in you both the will and do of His good pleasure. Okay. If that isn't true, then God's a liar, and my God doesn't lie, because you know because my God is sovereign. He does what He says He's going to do. So we are preaching. We are preaching to those who are complete those who are new creations in Christ Jesus, those who have been redeemed by the blood of His cross, whose sins have been forgiven, who've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And it is not the wisdom of the world or the wisdom of the, this age or the wisdom of the rulers of this age. It is God's wisdom, the perfect, finished work of Christ on behalf of those for whom Christ died. And I, I want you to take note also here, take note of the fact that what the text says is that the crucifixion of Christ was in the ordination of God. 
before the foundation of the heavens and the earth. Uh, take note of the personal pronouns. Do that always when you're studying. Always look at the personal pronouns. However, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery hidden, which God predestined before the world unto our glory. We preach the wisdom of God in a mystery. So, we need to understand that when we see this word mystery, it is referring to Revelation, uh, Scripture, God's Word. The word in the Greek there, mysterion, as, as it's used in the Greek Testament, means this is something that you can't know unless it's revealed. And he didn't reveal that mystery to everyone, but to us. Note the personal pronoun, to us. That is those who are redeemed. And to everyone else, it's foolish. Except by revelation, there's no way that you can understand God's wisdom in Jesus Christ unless it's revealed to you. You can't argue anyone into heaven. You can't argue anyone into accepting Christ uh, to be uh, as their Lord and Savior. Please do not make the mistake of believing that if, if only you were an expert in biblical apologetics, you could argue anybody into heaven. I've had people say, uh, I, no problem, I could have them down on their knees in a second, except in Christ. It's a wasted exercise. It is very, very easy for us to reach the conclusion that we can do something to affect someone else's position in life to be redeemed. We're talking about a supernatural work of God, a very special process, born again by the will of God, so we can't do that. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It is not the work of preaching, even though it comes through preaching. It is not the work of evangelism, even though it comes through evangelism. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's don't leave the Holy Spirit out of this. Uh, we've been given the privilege of proclaiming the truth, but only the Holy Spirit can seal it to someone's heart. Only He can filter out the foolishness and seal the truth to their heart. Dearly beloved, how do you tell someone to believe something? You know, you can tell them what to believe, but you can't tell them how to believe. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, I'll give you the name of a couple of pastors who think that they can do it, but I don't know how to do it. I can tell you what God says. If you believe it was not a result of some strenuous exercise of your mind, but it was the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're speaking God's wisdom, and that wisdom is revealed in Jesus Christ. I've said the book is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, but it is primarily a revelation of the person and work of Christ, and that's what the word mystery means. It's not some kind of a secret, okay? It is a truth that, that can only be known by revelation when he opens a person's eyes and mind and heart to see the truth. Therefore, it's a mystery to those to whom it is not revealed. And uh, that, that's why Jesus spoke in parables, you know, one reason. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, not us. This revelation or this mystery was hidden. It's hidden to those who are not new creations in Christ Jesus. But it, it is not hidden to those who are His. It's not hidden to you if He died in your place. And that situation, uh, that mystery which is revealed to those who are His and hidden to those who aren't, was predetermined by a sovereign God before the world was ever created and unto our glory. And the word world there is age. It's not cosmos. It's the word age. Uh, 
the beginning of was at the beginning of the church age. I mean, it appears it was it was hidden before the beginning of the church age. I think it was before he created. I think God had predetermined this exactly the way it is, and he did it for our glory. You know, I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed uh, in us. You know, many times, many times we think, you know, God is doing this to show forth his power, you know, his majesty, his sovereignty, his wrath. But he pre determined this for our glory. What chance do you have to be glorified with Christ other than God predetermining that Jesus Christ would die in your place? I amazing. He, he predetermined this before the world for our glory. You know, a lot of Christians believe that when we stand before God, we're going to be separated, you know, the good ones and the bad ones, you know. They have, they have the idea that some of us will be glorified and others will not. But I tell you, you stand before God right now, today, if he died in your place, you stand before God without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. You will stand before him absolutely without fault, without blame, glorified. He predetermined that for our glory. And dearly beloved, you ought to take a lot of comfort in that. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. No ruler in any place at any time would have crucified the Lord of glory, not if they had understood what we understand. Verse 9, but as it is written, this is one of my favorite verses, as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them, them, another important personal pronoun there that love him well what are those things what are those things are those big cat cattle ranches like you know in yellowstone uh, uh, pretty green golf courses uh, big blue beautiful blue crystal clear uh, lakes you know fishing uh, oh the greatest fishing tur tournament you know we you know you know is that the, the, the streets of gold is, you know, being paved for us, you know, the, I mean, is that the New Jerusalem being built? Is that, you know, he, he said he's, he was going away to prepare a place for us. Is that heaven? That's, that's my question to you. Is that what he's talking about? Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So we, we just can't know these things. Well, if you just read on, Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The deep things. What, what, what are the deep things of God? Are we just to fill in the blanks here? I mean, you know, well, the deep things of God, those are just things we can't know. Okay, I mean, do you honestly think that He's saying that this is something we can't know? Because it's the deep things of God. And for, dearly beloved, I just do not think that that's something that our fleshly minds should conjure up. I mean, could it be that these things God has prepared for us who love Him, and, and note that we, we take serious note that the only reason you love Him is because He first loved you, the things which He prepared beforehand for our glory. Could that not be the works of Christ that we're to walk in? Okay that we should walk in them. Because I read, for, I, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That's not our own works, okay? He's the vine, we're the branches, which God hath prepared 
ordained that we should walk in them. Them. What? What works? His works. The finished work of Christ. Ephesians 2.10 Verse 10, But God hath, has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. By His Spirit. For the Spirit searches, examines all things. I want to take a moment just to stop here and just remind you that when Jesus was confronted, you know, He had, uh, I believe it's uh, Matthew chapter 21, 22, thereabouts, and he's, He goes into the temple, He's teaching, he gets into a confrontation with the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. And uh, they want to know by what authority he's preaching. And of course, he says, well, I'll tell you by what authority I'm preaching. If you just answer a question for me. And that was, you know, when John was baptizing. And I want you to keep in mind the word baptism means identification. Uh It'd probably serve me better to just run back here to this. All right, this would be Matthew 21, verse 25, uh, uh, backing up to 24. But Jesus answered and said to them, uh, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. 25, the baptism uh, of John. This is Jesus speaking. The baptism of John. And keep in mind, baptism meant identification, okay? Uh, where was it from? From heaven or from men? Okay? So you're seeing the wisdom of man being contrasted with the wisdom of God here being Christ. That's what I wanted to point out. Uh, and you can go on and read the rest of that, but that's... And I was looking at that in a, in a discussion, a very good discussion with uh, my brother Larry last night, which I enjoyed very much. You people help me. As, uh, you say I help you. You people help me. A tremendous uh, amount. So this word, the, this or phrase, the deep things of God, you know, uh, you know, deep is the word, uh, uh, bathos, okay, meaning the word literally means depth, okay, the depth of the things of God. And th the way that the word is used is, is in deep water, uh, fullness, uh, immensity, an extreme degree, deep laid plans, deep laid plans. And that, that is saying to me that God's grace in the work of Christ on our behalf the perfect finished work of Christ is deeper than the Marianas Trench. Okay. Yeah, Google that if you don't know what that is. It's a deep part of the ocean. It's about it's like 36,000 feet below sea level. So God has revealed them to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. We're, we're looking at the focus on Christ all through this, the, uh, the wisdom of man compared to the wisdom of God, the, uh, the preaching of the Word, the preaching of the Gospel, the wisdom of God, uh, all of that is Christ in His work, His finished work. If we don't look at it that way, then if we don't filter it through that, that lens, then uh, I don't see how we can properly understand what the, the thoughts that the Holy Spirit intended to convey as he went through this passage, this wonderful passage. And so, you know, I, going back to, to chapter 1, dearly beloved, I mean, look, look at what he said is true of you. Just read through, sit down, read through the first chapter into the second chapter, Keep in mind, there's no chapter divisions in the original text. I, we at Christians today, we stand in amazement at what God has done for us in Christ. We, I think we can only do that if we come to grips with the fact that there is nothing in us that merits anything 
It was when we were his enemy that he died in our place. When we were not loving him, trusting him, serving him. In fact, when we were running from him, he died in our place. When we wanted nothing to do with him. And in this love letter that we're looking at, and that's what it is. It's a love letter to his people. Folks, Scripture does not has very little to say to the non-believer except for judgment. Okay? This is God's love letter to you and to me. And dearly beloved, this book is the most precious thing you could hold in your hands. Please think about that. Of every, out of everything that you own, out of all, uh, everything that you possess, nothing holds a greater value than this book. And the time that we spend in it is precious. We don't know what the future holds. There may come a time where that we would will thank God for the verses that we've memorized. Well, anyway, we're going to pick up here. Uh, we're down to verse verse ten. The deep things of God. I'm going to I'm going to say that that's the finished work of Christ. If I go back to verse five that your faith should not be in, in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You've got two things to look at. One is, is that your faith or is that the faithfulness of Christ? And you can't separate the two. It is the faithfulness of Christ. The wisdom of men is being contrasted with the power of God. The power of God being the cross, being Christ and His work, His sufficient work on behalf of His people for whom He died in their place. And this is what we speak. We speak this wisdom among those who are complete, who are redeemed. We don't, we don't speak that wisdom among those who don't have ears to hear. Now, I've pointed out that we, I preach to the air, okay? And, and, and I am absolutely fully persuaded that God will save every one of His own people. It's, it's the reason He came into the world. He came unto His own, but His own received Him not. Okay? And the only way that you received Him, if you go back and look at John, uh, the book of John, the Gospel of John, first chapter, verse 13. The only way that you were able to even receive Him was because you were born by God according to His will, not your own, and born from above, not below, not by some decision you made. It had to be that way. I know for some of you it's very, very difficult to, to wrap your mind around the concept that you don't have the free will that you think that you have. Now, of course, don't mix apples and oranges, okay? You have the free will. You can have. You can go and make you a BLT, okay, a bacon and lettuce, lettuce, tomato sandwich, or you 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 have the ability to decide whether or not to to, to make a BLT or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You have that ability in you to do that, but do not carry that over into the spiritual realm of things to suggest that God has no right to choose His family but we have to all collectively decide who that is. Because that is not biblical. I'm sorry to tell you, it is not what this book teaches. God deigned to leave heaven's glory and deliver you, save you, redeem you and save you. There are two different words. He redeemed you in order to be saved. Saved from what? Saved from worry, fear, doubt. Dearly beloved, are we trusting Him? Because we may have some tough days ahead. And I want you all to know that I love you dearly. I pray for you constantly. And I so appreciate you being in my life. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.